Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Uh, Good morning, everybody. How are we doing this morning? Aspects of the illness. You know, why is that? Why is that uh, a topic? It's kind of an unusual topic, maybe. Uh, One of the reasons I felt strongly about doing it is because alcoholism is so misunderstood. It is so misunderstood by people in AA. It is so misunderstood by people that treat us for it, by professionals that treat us for it. They they misunderstand. Um, You know, it goes it goes across the board. Um, Back in the early days of treatment um, in the 1800s, there was a lot of drinking back in the 1800s. I mean, there was nothing to do. There was no TV. There was no internet. I mean, you just you know, there was no lights. You know, I mean. You, there was nothing really to do, so you'd wander down to the pub and and start drinking. And alcoholism and alcohol consumption per capita was hugely more back in the 1880s than it was now. Now, that led to a lot of people getting out of control. Chris was talking about there's a certain percentage of people who are genetically predisposed for alcoholism, and it's, it's always been that way. So what happened was a, a lot of uh, a lot of people saw this as an opportunity to try to help. Some of them were well-meaning. Some of them wanted wanted to do it as a business. But what they did was they started to try to put together treatment processes. Now in the 1880s, the Salvation Army started. Okay, and they were basically a Christian organization, and they they did they did the best they could, and they brought a lot of people in, and the organization really grew. Then there was the, the Keeley Centers. The Keeley Centers, uh, this guy Keeley decided that he was going to invent, you know, uh, an actual cure for alcoholism that was called the gold cure. And what it was was when you went to a Keeley Center, they would shoot you up with heavy metals four times a day. You know, you'd get in line and then you'd, you'd go about your business and they had, you know, therapeutic stuff and everything. And there, there was all these different kinds of treatment processes. Now, when you look back on the history of these treatment processes, you'll see that the ones that have an emphasis on spiritual transformation were the ones that had high outcomes. And I believe it's, I believe it's the same today. You know, the, the, the centers that I, uh, I personally like to, um, uh, like to recommend to people that I care about are, uh, it's, it's like a new type of thing that's, it's not really new, but, uh, it's the recovery centers. You know, a couple, a couple of my very, very good friends, uh, work at these. And that's where the emphasis is on spirituality rather than having a complete clinical, uh, emphasis. Because this is a, this is a spiritual illness. Now, the doctors, they want to help us. And there's all kinds of scientific studies that are going on and, you know, especially in the pharmaceutical industry. They are racing to find more and better drugs to put us on to help us with our alcoholism. But they don't get it. You know, they don't get it. Uh, anybody that's been around long enough is gonna is gonna know that about every year or so something hits the news that's real great news for alcoholics. It's either a, a DVD, you know, recovery set that you see late at night on TV, or there, or it's a pill. You know what I mean? Like there's this pill that's coming out, and if you take this pill, it'll allow. If you're an alcoholic and you take this pill, it'll allow you to have two drinks sociably. You know, but they don't. But they don't get it. We, We're going to say one pill, two drinks socially. Give me 10 pills and I can drink 20 drinks socially. You know, I mean, how do you, how do you get past that problem? You know what I mean? Like they, they don't, they don't, they just don't, they just don't get it. And there are so many well-meaning people out there that, that are, that are just, just trying to offer us a solution. And we know what the solution is. It's just, it's just not. It just doesn't translate into money for the pharmaceutical companies. Our our solution is a spiritual solution. 
That's the solution that works the best. You know, the, listen, the studies are in. And it's observable. It's observable. I talked, I talked uh, last night about the people that I've taken, I've personally helped lead through the steps. And the people that did not balk, that did it, you know, fearlessly, thoroughly, painstakingly. Those people are all still sober today, living really good lives. I mean, we know what works, but it doesn't make sense to so many people. Alcoholism is an unorthodox illness. You know, when you see a, a normal illness, uh, let's say you have cancer, or you have pancre pancreatitis or, you know, any of these other things, you'll go to a doctor and there'll be a, there'll be a pill, there'll be a, a process, there'll, there'll be some kind of physical therapy, there'll be something that will help you get back to well. In addictive illness, we, we really have to participate in a certain way, we have to participate in our own recovery. We have to, we have to participate in the maintenance of our spiritual condition. And that's a very unorthodox treatment for an illness. Think about the doctor's opinion in here. Dr. Silkworth was chief physician at a renowned drug and alcohol hospital. In the mid-30s, you know, there weren't a lot of drug and alcohol hospitals. And if you went into a regular hospital, they were loath to accept you, as it says in this book. Because what would happen is, typically, the relapsing uh, alcoholic who's gone down the scale will, like, come into the hospital, oh, please help me, please help me, you know, they'll we'll put them in a bed, they'll detox them up, they'll start to feel a little bit better in a couple of days, and they'll start to they'll start to see what's actually wrong with the running of this hospital. You know, you guys are, you guys are doing it wrong here. You know, I, you know, I don't think this is really fair how I'm being treated here. And they get a resentment and, and split without paying their bill. And then they'll be back two weeks later. You know, I mean, this would, this is what would happen back then. So these hospitals that, 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 uh, establish themselves as drug and alcohol, uh, specific, you know, this guy is chief physician at this hospital. And all of a sudden, Bill Wilson comes in. He has a spiritual awakening on his hospital bed because he becomes willing to take spiritual action that's transformative. It's trans, this, the, the things that they were doing in the Oxford, Oxford group were transformative. They were supposed to be. And what happened was Bill Wilson, you know, ha, you know, had this great idea. And I think we're all here because of it. And that idea was there's probably millions of alcoholics out there dying who could use what I've just discovered, that spiritual transformation. And all of a sudden he starts to talk with Dr. Silkworth. And then he starts to show that he's recovered. Okay, he starts to go out and he starts to bring other alcoholics in. And he's, you know, he's bringing them in and he's sitting with them at the bed. And he's, he's about the work of working with others. He's about that business. Now, Silkworth is impressed by this. And the people that pay attention to what Bill is asking them to do start to recover. Now, here he is. He's a chief physician at this hospital. And he has to admit that everything that they know, everything that they do, they still have they still have what is known as a hopeless alcoholic. And that hopeless alcoholic is someone who treatment will not recover. Now, a lot of the people that went through this hospital hadn't gone down the scale very far, and they achieved some kind of, you know, some, some kind of help. They were able to stop or moderate. But Silkworth knew there was a characterization of a category of hopeless alcoholic. And all of a sudden, Bill Wilson starts to make a dent in those people. The people that Silkworth said, you know, I, you know, I, I wash my hands of these people. I, you know, I'll detox them. I'll give them vitamins. I'll, squ I'll squirt, squirt them with water and hydrotherapy. I'll give them belladonna, you know, so they hallucinate. But, but there's nothing really I can do for these people. And, and, uh, and all of a sudden, Bill Wilson is doing something for them. Now, instead of Silkworth getting all paranoid that, that some wacko is going to, you know, take money out of his pocket because he's the expert on alcoholism, 
Silkworth, because he's an ethical, compassionate man, says, you know, I support this. Not only do I support it, you know, you know, uh, I'll, you can trust anything that these people say. Now he really was, he really was taking a chance here. This is pure suicide. And, but, but it's the same, alcoholism is the same today as it was back then. And there are treatment processes that are going to help with a lot of different things. But when you look at the category of the hopeless alcoholic, treatment at best is about discovery and detox. You still need the recovery process. And that's, that, that really is the 12 steps. I think there may be some other ways to have a spiritual awakening. You know, I don't have personal experience with it, but a lot of people, uh, a lot of people talk about that. I, I don't know, but I do know that a spiritual transformation is absolutely needed. The, we have, we have problems in the way we think. We have problems in the way we perceive things. We perceive things in an incorrect manner. You know, I really thought I saw the world accurately, but you know, I didn't. I, I was mentally ill. And the only way for me to, to figure out just how mentally ill I was, was to, to get well, you know, to start to heal. And I look back on the way I acted. I, I look back on the way I perceived the world, my attitudes, my outlooks. And they were bizarre. You know, they were, they were, they were crazy. And sometimes, sometimes, how, how do you know what you don't know? I think this kills a lot of alcoholics. So many of us have attitudes like, you know, I've got this. I've got this problem under control. Or all I really need to do is stop drinking. Or, you know, my, you know, my, my therapist said, or, or whatever. We have these ideas about what is going to help us get better. But alcoholism, especially for that categorization of hopeless alcoholic, is so aggressive that it takes an unbelievably aggressive process. It takes a spiritual transformation. You know, we, 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 we have to change the way we view the world. We have to change the way we think. We have to change the way we behave. But don't make any big decisions in your first year, you know? I mean, just change everything, but, you know... Uh, You know, Alcoholics Anonymous today, and this is, you know, this is, this is true. I, I also love Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, I, I spend a lot of time, uh, in it. I support it how, how, however best I can. But I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, above, uh, criticizing what I see going wrong with it. Now, what, what I think has happened is I think, um, I truly believe this. I think that the decisions and the structure and the management and the maintenance of Alcoholics Anonymous as a fellowship emanating out of New York City has been more about the business of increasing fellowship than it's been about the business of holding on to a primary purpose. Holding on to, no matter how far down the scale you've gone, you know, you, you, you know, you could, you, you know, uh, one of the main things that I think Alcoholics Anonymous should be paying attention to is rarely have we seen a person fail who's thoroughly followed our path. Now, why would you want a monstrously large fellowship instead of one that is about the business of recovery from alcoholism? Why would you want that? What would be the motivation? Could it possibly be money? Who knows? I, I, re I really don't know. But the fact of the matter is, is AA is now a, a place where you can be very happy and very, you know, very, uh, very feel very safe and nurtured, you know, for, for the heavy drinker. It's become a death zone for the alcoholic. Now, what happened with me early on was uh, I was really desperate. I mean, I went down the scale pretty far. It finally got my attention and I finally started to go to a bunch of, uh, a bunch of AA meetings because I was told to do that. You know, I got a sponsor. I found out later my sponsor wasn't an alcoholic. I mean, he even admitted it to me. He goes, Chris, I, I was a speed freak for a while. I got in trouble with some speed. I got arrested. You know, I was remanded to AA. 
why, why they would remand somebody that's busted for speed to AA, I have no idea, but this was like around 1980. And, you know, he, 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 he liked what service did for him. So he did a lot of service work and he sponsored a lot of guys. And, you know, uh, he had never cracked the big book. He'd never done the steps. As a matter of fact, he saw it as silly. You know, the people that actually talked about this book, he saw them as, as reactionary, as, you know, uh, fanatical. Like, no, that's, you don't need to do that. What you need to do is you need to go to meetings and you need to make coffee. Now, this is the best he could give me. Now, did he want to hurt me? Absolutely not. He loved me, and he thought he was giving me the absolute best he could give me. And he made sure I went to meetings, and he was paying attention to whether I was, whether I was making coffee or not. But the fact of the matter was is, that, you know, trying to treat alcoholism with attendance at meetings and making coffee is like trying to stop a semi with a cobweb, okay? Alcoholism is much too aggressive to respond to something like that. Now, did it help my attitude a little bit? May, you know, maybe, but, but you know, I, I, I started to deteriorate because after a long period of time without alcohol, I, I do, I get worse. I get worse in my attitude. I get my spirituality starts to sink. And in these groups, in these AA groups, I'll tell you about some of the things that would happen. I remember this one time it was a step group Almost all the meetings were in a big circle and you would, you know, you try to get everybody to share, which really is a bad idea. You know, I mean, oh my God. Well, we want everybody to be able to share. Why? Uh, do you want to drive everybody out, you know, who's an alcoholic? Because, because alcoholics just can't put up with, with, with that, with the, with the heavy drinker sharing too long. But, uh, but anyway, they go around the room, and I remember uh, two guys are on a 12-step call. They're, you know, they're, two guys are on a 12-step call. This guy who'd been a, a member for a long, long time ended up, he had, he got throat cancer, and, uh, you know, he was on pain meds, and he had the tracheotomy and everything. And he started drinking, and his wife called these AA guys up and said, please come, you, you, you gotta help him. He's pouring the bottle, like, down the hole in his throat, you know? Please come. And, and so these two guys showed up. I'm new, maybe a month or two, you know, and, and not, you know, I still have my head down, my, my head is Chris, you know, I'm sure like this, and no self-esteem. Anyway, uh, they bring this guy in, and he sits down, and it goes back to step one, which isn't really, not really, it's, that's kind of appropriate. It goes back to step one and everybody's sharing their war stories going around the circle. And, uh, and this guy thinks that everybody is sharing at him, which, you know, he's drunk and, and, and they, they kind of were, they were kind of trying to help him. And so he's, he's going, rrr, rrr, rrr. he's making a little bit of noise. Now at the end of the meeting, they decided to have a group conscience to, because some people were really annoyed that he was, you know, he was making a little bit of noise. They wanted to, they wanted to vote on not allowing drunk alcoholics to come into the meeting anymore because it disturbed these people. Now, like, if you're an alcoholic, doesn't that just piss you off? You know, but if, but if, but if you had an alcohol problem, and, you know, you're going to AA for your problem, and it's turned into your social club, and that's where your friends are, and you get a coffee there, and you get away from the wife or the husband for a little bit of, a little bit of time. You know, it would annoy you, wouldn't it? I mean, the, these were the group, this is the type of groups that I was, that, that, that I was trying, I was trying to recover in. And, uh, and I think a lot of alcoholics were dying. The people that were coming in and, and not being, you know, being, you know, like being sober for two or three weeks like this and then drinking, those were, those were the losers. Those were the people who didn't really want it. Those were the people who were not being honest with themselves. And you were to ostracize them. Now, is this the exact opposite of what this book says? This book does not say stick with the winners. This book says stick with the losers. The winners don't need you. You want to you 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 want to heal the healed? You know you want to have a little group where everybody's recovered and you don't have to deal with any of those crazy alcoholics. It doesn't make any sense. 
Now, how did Alcoholics Anonymous get so off track? How did it? You know, how did it? Is it possible that, is it possible that the decisions made outside or, or around New York contributed to this because they were more interested in increasing fellowship numbers than they were in holding on to the integrity of the recovery process. Could it have been the members? Could it have been the group conscience when, when the majority of people were non-alcoholic? These are all questions we should ask because these are, th- we need to know this and we need to try to help with the solution because al- alcoholics are still dying. There are pockets of enthusiasm. There are meetings where if you come in and you're an alcoholic, you've got a real good shot of getting an experienced sponsor who's going to going to try to start moving you into the steps right away. There are groups in New Jersey now. Fifteen years ago, there wasn't. Okay? There's areas in the country where it's almost the norm. Uh, you know, I'm in North Carolina now, and and every single meeting I've gone into so far if you really were alcoholic, you would get people moving into your space offering to help you with this process. And quickly, not a step a year or some crazy thing like that. I used to hear that back in the 90s around here. Step a year. You really might as well give me a gun. Um, aspects of the illness. Because alcoholism is so aggressive, it affects practically every part of your life. It affects your attitudes. It affects your outlook. It affects your personality. It affects the personal relationships that you have and how you go about maintaining those personal relationships. It affects your health. It affects your sanity. Uh, we don't give alcoholism enough credit as far as how devastating it is because inherent in alcoholism is an almost utter inability to, to have an accurate self appraisal, to really know how much trouble we're in. We, we, we don't get it. We come in and we're just hoping to separate from the booze. And if I can just separate from the booze, I think I can put the pieces of my life back together again. But the way we're wired, we're wired for self-destruction. We're wired for, uh, for, for failure and defeat on almost, almost every level. Um, another thing that needs to be understood that no one talks about anymore in AA, I shouldn't say no one, so there are people that do, is the scale of alcoholism. They talk about it in this book. No matter how, down, how far down the scale you've gone, you'll find your experience can benefit others. Your ability to quit on a non-spiritual basis will, will depend on the amount of control you've lost in drink. You know, you look at the chapter to wives. They, they've got no, number one, two, three, and four. A uh, heavy drinker all the way through a chronic uh, low-bottom alcoholic. We need to understand this scale. You know, back in the 90s, when, you know, when I was first fellowshipping, really, they, everybody wanted to feel like they're all equal. Everybody, you know, you know, if you, if you showed up here, you're in the right place. You know, no one gets to AA by accident. And everything was about in equality across the board. But the fact of the matter is, is alcoholism is not equal. Some of us have gone down the scale further than others. And if you've crossed the line where no human help can relieve your alcoholism, you need a spiritual solution and you need it pronto before alcoholism kills you or somebody else. Alcohol is so so devastating it kills people that don't even have it. You know, it's not a lot of other illnesses that do that. Um, so the scale, we need to be, the, the one thing I like is on the coins, the coins that you get up in the north, the one year, two year coins, on the back it says, to thine own self be true. 
And I believe we need to do that. I believe we need to, in the beginning, somebody helps qualify us, but we need to be honest with ourselves about our alcoholism. What is our first step truth? Where are we? You know, we really need to pay attention to this question. Because if you haven't gone down the scale very far, if, if, you know, if you have an alcohol problem, a lot of people with alcohol problems show up in AA, you know, you probably won't have to work a 12 step program in, you know, three weeks. However, if you're one of those chronic relapsers, if you're one of those, one of those people who just don't understand, you, you, you know, no matter what goes on in your life, alcohol goes back in your body. No matter what the external situation, no matter what your decisions are, no matter who you're hanging out with, alcohol just seems to go back in your body. And it's slowly getting worse. It, you know, if you're, if you're one of those people, you are going to need, uh, you're going to need, uh, a spiritual answer. Now they learned this, uh, back in the old days. Uh, they learned, uh, they learned what would work with alcoholism. Around the time that Bill and Bob were, uh, were spinning dry, there was the Oxford group. And the Oxford group really was a, a Christian, uh, evangelical Christian organization that was all about practicing first center, century Christianity, not going to church for an hour on Sunday and listening to the sermon. They were about getting busy, you know, boots on the ground. Let's go practice these first century Christian principles. Now, both Bill and Dr. Bob are both going to the Oxford group prior to their meeting. Bill, after a couple of, couple of relapses or whatever, decides to really plug in with the Oxford group. Okay. When they ask him to go up there and witness, he witnesses. You know, he's pulling people in. He's trying, he's trying to bring people in. You know, he's, he's about the business of doing the spiritual exercises that Ebby suggested to him. And he is staying sober. Now, Dr. Bob is exposed to the same fellowship, and what he's doing is he's going late, he's leaving early, and he's not getting involved. And guess what? He's drinking, okay? This is so much more about what you do than about what you think, the spiritual answer. You know, most, most, most sponsors are, are way less interested in your opinion on something than they are on what did you do today? <laughs> and there's a reason for that. You know, as a newcomer, you're, you're, sometimes you're, you're put off. You're taken aback by the sponsor's attitude, you know, like they're, they're not taking this problem seriously. And, and it's, it's because it's probably not a serious problem. Uh, you know, your real problem is alcoholism. So, so they're not paying attention to, you, you know, the, the, the trouble with the neighbor, you know, who's putting the leaves on your yard or something. Not, they can care less about that. What they're asking you is, you know, did you go to a meeting tonight? And, you know, what, you know, have you finished your third column of the fourth? You know, they're asking you those questions and you're looking at them like, what, you know, what, what does that have to do with the leaves? There's leaves on my yard. Yeah. You know? And it's, it's but a, a good sponsor will be bringing you right back, bringing you right back to the to the work that needs to be done. The work, but you know that even that term, it became very unpopular in Alcoholics Anonymous. Every once in a while, you'd hear you know somebody would mention, oh, you know, I'm going through the work again, and some some old timer, you know, some cranky old old timer would go, the work, kid. If they would have told me that you had to do the work when I came into AA, I'd have been right out the door. Now, you know, what he's not understanding is, who the hell would have cared? You know, we don't need you. You know what I mean? My God, we really don't need you. Uh, there was so much, there's so much bad information being passed around in AA. And, and you know, a lot of times it's well-meaning. A lot of times it's, you know, you know, my, you know, my, my counselor said, or, you know, uh, my sponsor said, or I, you know, I learned in this new book about, you know, achieving personal grandeur, you know, or whatever, you know, and, and all this stuff, all this stuff gets shared. And one of the great things I think that Bill Wilson ever said was, he said that the good can sometimes be the enemy of the best. 
Now, when you're sitting in these meetings and somebody shares something about positive affirmations, okay, well, what I do is I get up in the morning and I do positive affirmations. I stand in front of the mirror and I say, I say, Chris, you're a wonderful guy. <laughs> you know, and boy, I feel wonderful. Okay, well, for, first of all, it's really doubtful you're an alcoholic. If, if something like that works. But second of all, like, let's, let's really, let's really look at this. You know, is, are affirmations bad? No, affirmations are good. They help a lot of people. They set people's, you know, perspectives right on track sometimes. But the good is sometimes the enemy of the best. So if you're sharing about that in a meeting, you could be sharing about the real solution. You could be sharing your experience, your strength, and your hope as it concerns alcoholism. And, and that's the best. And the problem with a lot of the stuff that's happened in AA is the good became the enemy of the best. Now, this happened with our literature. I think it still continues to happen with our literature. So much of the service structure is about, you know, doing a pamphlet, you know, for, uh, you know, for faith healing pygmies. You know, we got to have a pamphlet for faith healing pygmies. You know, so, so there's whole committees and everything, you know, and, you know, I, I, I don't know. Uh, maybe those pamphlets are needed. Uh, but I'll, I'll give you a big example, an example that, that I believe at least. And this, you know, take this as opinion. For the first 15 years of AA, at least, at least for, you know, when the big book was published till about 1951 or 52, the book Alcoholics Anonymous was it. It was the textbook. It was what everybody went to. It was the default literature that everybody fell back on. Okay. And if you look back in the history of AA, you know, I'm not saying every meeting was always on the beam, but you know, they were about the business of, of gathering alcoholics. And they were about the business of the transformation needed for long-term sobriety. That's the business they were about. Well, Bill Wilson comes up with the idea of we really need 12 traditions. You know, we need to hold this fellowship together. I'm seeing all kinds of disunity. I'm seeing, you know, I'm seeing schisms. And, you know, there's, there's turbulence in different groups. Let's put together some traditions. And, and you know, he was a far-seeing guy, and the, the traditions, uh, in essence, are very, very valuable and very, very helpful for the unity of the organization. But he decides nobody's going to buy this book. Who the hell is going to buy 12 traditions for the unity of the group? Be honest. How many people in here have the 12 concepts for world service in their library? Let the record show out of 800 people, because these tapes are going back to my home group. Out of, out of 800 people, only five people raised their hand, okay? Bill, Bill Wilson didn't think we were stupid. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't a stupid guy. He knew 12, 12 traditions that'll help a group. We're not going to buy that. We're going to go to the self-help section. You know, it's got to be about us. It's got to be about me. You know, hell with the group. So he decided, I, you know, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll write 12 essays on the 12 steps and put that in the front of the book, and the thing will fly off the shelves. Okay? That was his decision. You can find this information out in the book, The Soul of Sponsorship, his letters between Father Ed Dowling and himself. He admits this. He tells Ed Dowling, you know, I put the 12 traditions in front of this book as bait so that they'll buy the, tw the 12 traditions, the 12 steps in front as bait. So what happens? All of a sudden, this book comes out. Every AA member buys one. You know, I start looking through it. Oh, this is really good. You know, 12 steps. There's, there's 12 weeks uh, in three months. And there's, there's, you know, you, you could go through the whole step book four times in a year. It makes mathematical sense. Let's start a step meeting. Okay, and, and, and all of a sudden you can't shake a stick without hitting a step meeting. And I was going to step meetings like crazy in the early days, in my first couple of years, because I recognized inside myself something needed to heal. And I knew this was a 12-step program, and I knew the people that cared about the steps went to step meetings. I thought going to the step meetings was really working a program. I thought going to meetings was working a program for a long time. I really did. So I'm going to four step meetings a week. 
Now, only after I got experience with the big book and went through the steps did I realize that step meetings are the place where people go to talk about the steps, read about the steps, philosophize about the steps, share about the steps, but nobody does them. Rarely, rarely will somebody raise their hand and say, you know, I've got experience with this step. Let me tell you my experience with this. That's rare. More often than not, somebody will go, I haven't done the ninth step formally, but I'm going to take the meeting hostage for the next 15 minutes, share my opinion on what I think this step is all about. And I'm going to, I'm going to these meetings, you know, and, and sometimes you'll, you'll listen to the guy that sounds the coolest and you think he's got the best sobriety. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's the old timer in the back just shutting his mouth because he can't take it. You know, just sitting there, just fellowshipping. Uh, why do I need this spiritual transformation? Why do I need to be changed so fundamentally when I really don't think there's much wrong with me? You know, I'm really a good, you know, my intentions are good. I'm really kind of a good guy. I'm kind of smart. And yeah, I end up, you know, shooting myself in the foot like every five minutes. But, you know, there's not really, all, you know, I just need to get rid of the alcohol and, you know, get a new relationship and a new job and maybe move somewhere where, you know, there aren't angry neighbors and, you know, and where the cops aren't vindictive and, you know, always arresting me, you know. That's all I really need. And, you know, you know what? We, we need to be rebuilt. It talks in this book about being reborn. Why do we need to be reborn? If your perspective is wrong, if you have a dark, uh, ill perspective on life, that's going to tarnish everything you are about on this planet. It really is. And the fact of the matter is, is so many of us don't really think we're as ill as we really are. The great news about these steps are these steps begin the healing process, begin the healing process with us. But if our attitudes and our outlooks uh, are, are ill, it's going to affect how successful we are in every area of our lives. You know, I look back on, uh, you know, so, some people were able to achieve a lot with alcoholism. So, some people... You know, the, the progression can be fast, it can be slow. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different uh, ways that this, this illness manifests. It manifested itself very, very quickly with me. Um, I started drinking when I was about 13, and I, and I was a blackout drinker at 13, you know, and, uh, and I never could get out of my own way to, to finish college, to get a good job. I mean, I really, I was stopped early because of, uh, of how, how the alcoholism and how the alcohol use handicapped me. And I finally, I finally uh, get into Alcoholics Anonymous at 32, 33 years old. That's like a pretty typical age for some of us. And I'm living at home with mom. I've got a, 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 a terrible job. Uh, you know, I, I work for a, a psychotic uh, electrical contractor. Uh, I've got a terrible car. I've got no friends left. I mean, really, I was about at, at the bottom of the scale. Now, you know, what was I doing wrong? How was I, how was I handicapping myself? I had an utter inability to deal. That's really what it was. Lack of dealage. <laughs> I would get so far into something and, and I would need to get drunk. You know, I'd change my mind about how important it really is. And I, you know, I'd go off and get drunk or I'd quit or I'd split or, you know, and this happened time and time again. Now that's an aspect of alcoholism. It's not one that every single alcoholic shares, but it's an aspect of alcoholism. And I believe it's an aspect of alcoholism because the step process, meeting steps and service, have helped me to heal from that. And I can be consistent with the things I aim at now. Uh, I, I don't cut and run. I was a great starter. Does anybody relate to that? Really good starter? I decided I'm going to take guitar lessons. 
I took two lessons. The guy wanted to teach me flamenco. I took two lessons, stole the guitar, and never went back. <laughs> I decided I'm going to join the Boy Scouts, you know, buy all the uniforms. You know, this is like when I'm 11 years old. Buy all the uniforms, you know, get the hat and, you know, all the books on knot tying and everything. And, you know, I go up to the meetings, and we go on, we go on a camp out, the first camp out. It's a freaking freezery. Does anybody know what a freezery camp out is? That's where you go camping in like February, okay? I'm, I'm in a cotton sleeping bag and it rained and, and everything was wet and then it went down to like 20 degrees. So I'm in a wet sleeping bag. I never went back to Boy Scouts again. You know, I quit. I'm going to go to college, okay? I'm, I'm going to go down to the University of South Florida, okay? I got some, some community college credits. I'm going down there and I'm going to be an accountant. I'm going to make something out of myself, you know? And I get down there. And I spent three and a half years and got six credits. <laughs> you know? Now, this isn't what happens with every alcoholic. But what happened to, to me was I just, I got distracted. You know, I, you know, like, like, okay, go to Statistics 2. Go to the pub with the buds and drink beer. That's a no-brainer. You know what I mean? And if you do that kind of stuff enough, you're going to get six credits too. Two, two, of the, two, two of those credits I got in this, in this class, it was, a, it was a pass-fail class. All you had to do was show up, you know, sign in and listen to this guy play the piano. He'd play Chopin or Rachmaninoff, you know, he's up there playing. All you had to do was sit there. And I come in and I decide, well, you know, he's really not paying attention. So I'll, I'll bring a six-pack with me, you know? So... I'm sitting and appreciating music and going like, going like, you know, and he'd be in the middle of the slow, passionate section, you know, you'd hear this, you know, I'm like, oh, so I got two credits for that, you know. Um, how's school going, honey? Uh, oh, I need more money, you know. Oh, God. Uh, it, it. An aspect of the illness is the people we choose to be in relationships with. Okay? When we're really sick, we don't go, we don't go after the healthy people. You know, they're not, well, they're not gonna let us go after them, you know? <laughs> I mean, you know, my first, my first girlfriend was, she, she was, she was a pre-Alanon, you, you have no idea, right? Okay, she was an untreated Alanon, just, it was wonderful. She thought about me as much as I did. You know, one, one of those. You know what I mean? And she came from an alcoholic, uh, alcoholic household. How, uh, her father and mother were dropped down, blackout alcoholics. All her brothers are dead from alcoholism, you know. And she saw me. Ooh! <laughs> you know? Home! You know? And, uh, and so you start the dysfunctional dance of death and, and, and uh, you know. Oh, God. She even left me. I mean, I was, my drinking got so bad, she even left me. And, and, and I got to really drink the next couple of years. You want to know why? Because she left me when I needed her most. You know, now it's bourbon time. Oh, God. Being able to stay employed. I mean, I don't know about anybody else, but I had trouble with that because they, I would slowly become aware of how unfairly I'm being treated. <laughs> don't they realize I could run this place so much better than my idiot boss, you know? And, and you know, I would have to go from one job to the other. Um emotionally, I think I suffered most. And you wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to pin this on alcoholism until I started to recover from it. But it was the unbelievable bondage of emotional pain I was always in. I suffered from this emotional pain like you wouldn't believe. And it started, like like Chris, it started at a very young age. And, and uh, when I got dropped off for kindergarten is my first recollection of intense self-centered fear. 
and it was because my mother drove me across town, opened up the door, said, there's the, there's the kindergarten class. I'll see you later. Closed the door and drove away. I'm five. Hadn't been getting out of the house much at that time. <laughs> really was spending a lot of time with one woman at that time. <laughs> and I'm standing up on the hill and I'm looking down and I'm like, Oh my God. You know, this is, who, who came up with this idea? You know? And the kids are down there, they're playing, they're playing kickball and tag, they're already friends. I'm like this loser standing up on a hill. And I, I'm like, I can't go down there. I can't go down there. What if they, what if they don't like me? What if I look stu- what if they mock me out? You know? What if I have to kill one of them? Cause I, cause they insult me. You know? I mean, I'm thinking all this stuff. And what I had to do, though, what I had to do, though, is I had to act as if I wasn't freaked out and go down and be a kindergartner. Now, here's what makes me an alcoholic. You know what would have really helped? A pint of vodka. (laughs) You're goddamn right. I'd have gone down there. I'd have been the kindergarten kid. You know what I mean? Oh, but the problem was they weren't serving five-year-olds back then. I had to go through eight more years of school, like acting as if I wasn't freaked out all the time, you know? Now, what, what, what really, what really is the problem? It's a spiritual problem. It's an emotional problem. I'm not in control of my emotional nature. Chris talked about, talked about depression. Do you know how much we're being overprescribed? in different medications. Do you have any clue? Over 250 million prescriptions for antidepressants were written in the United States last year. You know, you cannot tell me that there's that many people who suffer from clinical depression. Now, what happens with us is we present with depression if we haven't gone through the steps. We also present with anxiety. Those are two things. Every single alcoholic after they're detoxed, present with. Every one of us, we have to some degree or another depression and anxiety. Now, you can treat that through the doctors or the psychiatrist. You can. But the chances of it interfering a holistic, healthy recovery process, like you get in the steps, is also great. So I think a lot of us are getting picked off that way. And I would say one doctor out of a 100 understands addictive illness at a level where they can truly prescribe to us. You know what I heard in in AA the first five years I was in there? Trust your doctor. Tell your doctor what's going on. Tell your doctor you're an alcoholic. Okay, you know, you know how many people did that and then got a prescription for Percocets for a stub toe? You know what I'm talking about? Oh, you're an alcoholic? Oh, good. Here, have, you know, Percocet. 400. Here. I'm, I'm, I'm friends with a physician who's, who's, uh, uh, who's the president of ASAM. ASAM is the American Society of, you know, uh, of Addiction Medicine. And I asked him one time, point blank, I go, I go, okay, there's, there's 10,000 doctors that are certified in ASAM or something like that. I always get numbers wrong. Might be six, whatever. I said, how many of them could you really trust to prescribe to someone with addictive illness correctly so that they don't, they don't prescribe the wrong thing that's going to lead to relapse? And he goes, maybe half of them. So that tells me that there's maybe 5,000 doctors in this country qualified to prescribe medication to us and to understand the characteristics of addiction. A very, very interesting thing. There are three lawsuits moving their way up to Supreme Court right now. And you know what those lawsuits are? Somebody going up to a doctor and saying, doctor, I'm an alcoholic. I'm a drug addict. And then getting a medication that led to relapse and death. Okay. Those lawsuits are worming their way up to the Supreme Court. Now, I'm, a, I'm not a very litigious guy. I really am not. I'm not about the business of getting lawyers for everything. But I will tell you this, that that will send a shockwave throughout the medical community that they need to pay attention 
to what the hell they are doing to us. So I'm all for this. But probably what will happen is pharmaceuticals and, you know, the medical associations will stop this somewhere in the process and it will get thrown out of court. But I'm hoping it's going to make it all the way up. Because I'll tell you, so often we are told it's our fault when it really isn't. If somebody hasn't shown you the recovery process, is it really your fault that you're still drinking and relapsing? I don't think so. There, one of the things that I do, both, both Peter, Chris, and I are involved in uh, uh, addiction uh, recovery and, and addiction treatment uh, as a profession. And I get to interview and I get to uh, visit a lot of different treatment centers. And there's a lot of good treatment centers out there. And there's even better recovery centers. Uh, but there are some bad ones out there too. Okay. Way back, way back when they decided that certain types of therapeutics were going to be good for alcoholics, like the confrontational approach. Okay. That's when you, that's when you put a big circle in the room and you put somebody in the middle with a dunce cap on it, you know, and everybody goes after them. Or else they shave half your head and make you beg to have the other half shaved. Okay. I, where did this stuff come from? I know, I know as an alcoholic, I'm, I'm the frick out of there if somebody's going to do that to me because emotionally I can't take that kind of stuff. I am already, I've already been shamed enough by alcoholism to have something like that happen. Another thing that happens in treatment centers all the time is if someone is non-compliant with their program, you know, they didn't want it or they're non-compliant or they they dropped out, you know, it's their attitude. In other words, the treatment center is saying that the client was at fault and it's their fault, okay? Instead of following outcomes and trying to improve treatment processes, and everybody's different, trying to find client-driven methods, you know, for client-specific needs, instead of doing that, you flunk out of the model, you know, you didn't want it. Well, well, I got to tell you, I got to tell you, I'm going to you for treatment for alcoholism. I'm paying you 14 grand. Don't tell me, don't tell me it's my fault. You you know, you know what I mean? That, that's, that doesn't happen in, in cancer treatment. It doesn't happen, you know, in heart disease. They don't throw you out, you know, because you, because you, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you know, you, your cancer came back. Oh, your your cancer came back. You must not have wanted it. You know, I mean, that doesn't happen in in in, in uh, you know, it's either a disease, it's either an illness or a disease, or it's not. Really, really, it's not an attitude, you know, it's not an attitude problem. So what, what, one organization I've been working with has been pushing for 20 years, tying in outcomes to purchasing. In other words, the places that have high outcomes where people stay sober, let's give them the money. But what's going on in treatment right now is outcomes are irrelevant almost. You know, it matters how many beds you have, how many days you stay. All, the rest of this stuff really doesn't matter. Only in addictive illness do people not care. Now, when you're looking at outcomes, let's say you're looking at outcomes in heart disease or cancer. They can, they can go down to such a minute detail of outcome study that they will know that you're more likely to survive with scalpel A than if the doctor uses scalpel B. But there's no outcome studies in addiction. And the ones that they are, they don't want to, they don't want to look at. So it's an unorthodox illness. It's, it's misunderstood by everybody. Uh, the people that treat us for it, uh, are probably doing the, the best they think they can. But right now, right now we're in trouble. Right now there's way more of us dying than there should be. Um, I think the statistic is well over a hundred thousand. I think the statistic is a hundred thousand. See, I'm so numerically dyslexic; it's, it's ridiculous. Let's say a hundred thousand alcoholics die every single year. I know we could cut that in half with the right type of awareness. I know that by doing our job in Alcoholics Anonymous a little bit better, we could cut that in half. Um, 
too many people, too many people are dying. It is very, very easy to come into AA, get sober, and then take up a seat and kind of stay out of the fray, you know, kind of stay off the firing line. Uh, you have yours and, you know, uh, I'll work with a couple of sponsees and that's, that's what, you know, I'm good with that. That's my status quo. Well, when you look at the process as it's laid out in this book, the recovery process is almost not for us. When you look at the prayers, relieve me my difficulty so, so, so that I can help other people. When you look at the prayers, when you look at the steps, what they're doing is they're preparing us to be soldiers in the battle against alcoholism. And some of us take our, our duty seriously and, and some of us don't. The problem I have, uh, in, in Alcoholics Anonymous today is they're not telling us that they're not very rarely will literature come down from New York on high that tells us to get active besides doing like, like tradition workshops or something, you know, really getting active, really getting active on the front lines of alcoholism. Rarely is that encouraged in meetings today. You know, like what, what kind of detox commitments do we have? Are we going over to the booby hatch tonight? You know, hey, who's covering the hospital? Who's covering the hospitals for the drunks coming in for detox? Do we do that anymore? You know, we should be doing that. In the early days of AA, you know what they did? They had a meeting, maybe two. And in that meeting, they were all about the business of talking to each other about their prospects. You know, where are you going? Where are you, where are you going to look for prospects? How, how are you doing with that? And that would be Monday night. Tuesday night, they'd split up, and some of them would go to the hospitals. Some of them would go to the insane asylums. You know, some of them would go down to the Bowery. And they'd look for prospects. A prospect is, is somebody that you're, you're prospecting for them. You know, somebody that needs alcoholics. And I'm sure you're trying to see if they want to get sober. So you, you're, you're trying to qualify these people. Tuesday, you do that. Wednesday, you do that. By Thursday, you've got some prospects, and you're now working with them in the hospital because what they used to do is they used to bring their prospects to the hospital, and then they'd run one alcoholic after the other in to tell the story and to, for the identification process, and then they would take you through the third step, and then, and, and then you'd be about the business of recovery. Now, um, the weekend had come along and, you know, you, you'd have gotten somebody through the steps and you'd be explaining to them how they would work with other people. Okay. And Monday would come and you'd go back to your AA meeting. Now it's, it said we, we set aside in this book, it says we set aside one night a week where newcomers can share their problems. It doesn't say we set aside 400 meetings in one town where newcomers can share their problems. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. We're not supposed to be doing 90 and 90. We're supposed to be out prospecting for alcoholics and doing 12-step work. Now, listen, I, I include myself in this. I'm lazy in this myself, too. I do, I do, I probably don't do enough of this. But the fact of the matter is, is people, people are, are dying. I want to read, I want to read, uh, a bit from a story in the back here that I find very telling. This is in the, uh, this basically is on page 262 of the fourth edition. It's from the, it's from the story, he sold himself short. And it's at the very bottom line where I'm going to pick up. The day before I was due to go back to Chicago, it was Dr. Bob's afternoon off. He had me to his office and we spent three or four hours formally going through the six, six, six step program as it was at that time. Remember that it was still the Oxford group until the first edition was printed. Number one, complete deflation. Isn't that a little bit about our step one? Dependence and guidance from a higher power. That looks a little bit like steps two, three, eleven. Moral inventory. That looks like our step four. Confession. That looks like our step five. Restitution, that looks like our steps eight and nine. And continue to work with other alcoholics, that looks like our step 12. That really was the 12-step process in a couple of hours. 
but you don't want to do more than a step a year, you'll be rushing it. <laughs> Dr. Bob led me through all of these steps. At the moral inventory, he brought up several of my bad personality traits and character defects, such as selfishness. Self a- aspects of aspects of the illness, selfish this should be called <clears throat> selfish selfish ism anonymous. You know what I mean? Selfishness, that, that we think is the root of our trouble. It's not necessarily that we're so selfish that we're grabbing everything for ourselves. It's that we're self-obsessed. <clears throat> Every true spiritual master out there understands one thing, and he understands that we suffer because we, we, our, our perception is we are not one. We're not one with God. We're not one with the world. We are separate entities off all alone suffering on our own. You know, you, you look at any of the, any of the teachings from the, the spiritual masters and they'll all, they'll all share that as a misperception that we all have. Now being self-centered, being self-obsessed, I truly felt I was in a hostile environment. I thought that my problems were coming at me. I saw myself as as just just being in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people all the time. And that's a very self-obsessed perspective. Now, to go from a self-obsessed perspective to one of selflessness, which is really what this book is trying trying to aim us at, really is a shift in perception. Hopefully, uh, hopefully if you recover... What I believe happens, one of the things I believe happens is you go from a life system based on selfishness, self-seeking, and self-centered fear to a life system based on love, service, and compassion. You know, the, the foundation of your life system goes from one to the other. And the only way to get it from one to the other is these steps, is this action, this action that you take that gets you out of yourself that alerts you to the fact that there's other suffering in the world, you know, besides yourself, the 12-step work, that alerts you to the fact that you've caused a lot of damage, you know, steps steps four through, through nine, and you need to make restitution. These God-given, you know, loving steps uh, bring about a foundational healing in our spirit and in our consciousness and in our lives. And the miracle, I think, of this book is when you look at the people who were, Bill Wilson and the people that were surrounding him in 1939, you see a bunch of knuckleheads, really. You, you, you wonder how something of this depth and this weight could ever have been written. Listen, there are, there are thousands of people that have tried to write something more powerful than this book. Every five minutes, a book on alcoholism recovery comes out. None of them have sold 10 million copies. None of them have transformed the lives as this book has transformed them. The 12-step process is now uh, now the basis of recovery for over 12 uh, over 200 12-step groups. You know, so this is this is a foundational recovery process. If you think that, you know, I'm listening to these guys, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm identifying with a whole lot, you know, and yes, alcohol was really a problem, but, but, you know, I, you know, I, I, I my, my psychiatrist really says that, uh, you know, or, or, you know, I, I just can't really believe, you know, I feel so different. I just can't imagine that I would be like a run of the mill alcoholic. You know, if you if you have feelings like that and you have not gone through the steps, the only way for certain for you to know whether you're an alcoholic or not is 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 really to to know if your problem really is alcoholism is to is to take take the the treatment pro- process, do the treatment process, and if it works, you know may, maybe maybe you have maybe you have the illness, you know. Every single person I know who has actual working experience with this book is an advocate of the 12-step process. The only people I think who argue against 
the 12 step process are people who don't have personal experience with it. In my line of work, I run again, I run up against a lot of people who have a lot of anger and, and really don't like Alcoholics Anonymous, don't like the 12 step process, don't like the way AA deals with addiction. And they're much more clinical and, you know, they got this going on and that going on. And, you know, I have to, I have to ask myself, do they have experience going through the steps? Have they ever tried it? Because you're, ba- you're, you're sharing an opinion on them if you've never gone through them and you're going to criticize them. That's an opinion. You know, if you've gone through them, now you're, now you're sharing your experience. But I wonder that a lot of people out there really don't want this to be the solution. Because A, that you're alcoholic and could not manage your own affairs. B, that no human power could relieve you of your alcoholism. And C, that God could and would if he were sought. How are you going to make money with that? <laughs> How are you going to say that? <laughs> you know what I mean? And then say you need, you know, $400 an hour, you know, treatment twice a week. I don't know. Anyway, listen. If you don't have experience with these steps, but you've got some things going on in you, you know, that wrap around alcohol, wrap around emotional and spiritual angst and and pain and suffering, um, do yourself a favor. Get a hold of somebody who can help qualify you, who can show you what an alcoholic is, and then who can show you the recovery process. Please do that if you haven't done it already. Um, it, you know, not only, not only is it the difference between life, life and death, but it's also the difference between your quality of life. You know, everybody I know that's gone through this has got an incredible quality of life in a lot of different ways. You know, that's a byproduct. I would have had to do this just to survive. But the good news is it's more than, more than, you get more than survival. You get a whole new life that's absolutely incredible to live. Um, thanks for being here this weekend. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.